My name is Chessie Ricca and I am a master's student in the Florida Studies program at USF St. Pete. What this presentation is going to be on is my paleography research from this past semester, spring 2020. We're going to actually be looking at some of the documents that were written in 17th century Florida. We're going to divide this presentation into two parts. The first part we're going to do is look at the documents and discuss what they were writing about at that point in time. And then the second part of this presentation, we're going to look at the handwriting that the scribes used, and we're going to compare and contrast it. This document is entitled Santo Domingo 855, and it is 215 pages long. The dates it ranges from is 1673 to 1745. This is the first page of the document and at the top where the rip is, you can see where it almost wants to say auto. And then after that it says de Santo Domingo in shorthand in the Provincia de la Florida. Under that you will see where it talks about familias a la Provincia de la Florida y otras de Nueva España. So it's talking about the families in the province of Florida and then the families of New Spain, which is also in the area in the dates ranging from 1673 to 1745. This next page in the document discusses the current governor of Florida in the 17th century and his name was Don Manuel de Sendoya. Underneath that, it talks about the province of Appalachia, which is primarily what this entire document is going to be discussing. And just as a disclaimer, I'd like to point out that I do not translate the Spanish in these documents. I strictly transcribe them. So a lot of the times I have to look up what the words mean in these documents for me to be able to understand what they're actually talking about. So first I uh, transcribe them and then later I go back and, and translate what I need to translate to understand what they're discussing. In this document, the scribe is describing the land of Appalachia and how fertile it is, but the problem is that it lacks farmers. And so the fear with that is obviously that enemies are going to take over this fertile land. So he's discussing what lies in all directions around Appalachia. So you have the Bahama Canal, which he describes as being 150 leagues to the east, and then other areas like Mexico do west and some other stuff do north. I think the goal of the governor of Florida at the time was to protect the land of Appalachia because the land was so fertile there and there was nobody there to protect it. So his proposal was to get families, including infants from the Canary Islands over to the land of the Indies, meaning Florida, so that they could populate that land and also protect it from enemy invasion. The scribe finishes off this part of the document with his signature and before that he describes the importance of letting the king know of what their plans are between the governor of the provinces of Florida and the governor of the Canary Islands. So they have this plan to get families from the Canary Islands over to Florida, but they need to let his majesty in Spain know what is going on so they could have his support. Make note that at the end of this document, the scribe writes off his signature and signs his name, which is Francisco de la Guerra y de la Vega. In this document, what the author is discussing is the Indians in the area of Appalachia. He describes them as being extremely poor and naked, and he doesn't believe that they will be willing to farm and he is comparing them to the Indians of Campeche, saying that they also do not like to farm, which is why I believe that they want families from the Canary Islands because they are more willing to work. This is a very pretty page, and it is page two of the previous document we just looked at, and I think that what they're discussing here is bringing stuff to and from Havana, uh, but the issue is that the families they want to bring over are so poor they can't do it themselves and they also have to pay his majesty for the transfer and return of the items and the issue here is mostly monetary. A little further down in this document is the discussion of the 24 families of Campeche Indians, many of which are from what is now Texas 
and they want them as well to come to the land of Appalachia along with the Indians and families from the Canary Islands. This page is interesting because it seems to be a page of advice from the captain Domingo de Leneriondo, and he is the general of the provinces of Florida. And he's pleading on behalf of the Indians who are sent to go to Appalachie, uh, the ones from the Canary Islands and from Campeche. And he wants them to be able to trade more so that they could be more a part of Florida. And he wants them to be able to pay his majesty so that they can be like regular citizens of the Spanish providence of La Florida, which is really interesting. So he wants them to stay in Florida for four years. And then after that, I believe they could choose to stay or leave. After the discussion of the Indians and bringing the families over to Appalachie comes in the discussion of fortifying the port of Appalachie. And so later on throughout these documents is petitioners and governors responding to the order from the Council of the Indies saying that the request to fortify the port of Appalachie is important and they need to do it to protect it. So they want to bring the Indians and the families from the Canary Islands and Campeche to farm and settle and populate, but also to fortify and protect. So they want people there because there's some reason why this port is so important. Now the port of Appalachie does lie in the Gulf of Mexico, so that can connect Mexico to Cuba to Florida through the Bahama Canal and back to Spain so it's obvious to see the importance of this location and why it's so necessary now going through these documents you can see all the different types of handwriting signatures uh, the way the layouts of the papers are and how they're folded so now that we've gone through and discussed what is in the documents mostly we're going to switch and look at the forms of handwriting and the paleography itself and how these scribes chose to write words out uh, in both longhand and shorthand i'd like to start out by looking at this document because it is a perfect representation of the different ways they wrote so some of it is beautifully written spaced out very neat and tidy mostly because it was probably a legal document that they were sending to the king or some high official and then you can see some of the shorthand sloppy fast written things so they were just making notes or adding to a document something that they forgot to write a lot of the times when I'm looking through documents, I am looking for key words. And I liked this page because the things that stood out to me were the words Timuqua e Appalachie. And I enjoy seeing that because I know that the author or the scribe is discussing the specific Indian tribes because I know where the Timuqua Indians were located as well as the Appalachie. One of the most common words you see in these old documents is the words dicho or dicha. And it is a joke kind of amongst paleographers that when in doubt, if you don't know what a word is, it's probably a dicho or a dicha. But in the beginning of these documents, there was just the understood word dicho or dicha, but it was shorthand and it was spelled with the letters D-H-O. Now, towards the end of my reading through these documents, I noticed that another scribe chose to write the same word, but instead of just writing the D-H-O, he added a line through the word, and I found that very interesting because I have not seen that before. One of the common issues I have when looking at these documents is the wear and tear that occurs over centuries of sitting in archives. So like in this document, uh, you'll see where it says Familias de Indias Maestros, and that is underlined. But just beyond that, you'll see a day, and then this word, I don't understand what it is, because these ink blots, I believe, are in the way. So there's the issue of having to look back through the documents and see if I could find a word that looks like that, and then see if it fits into this particular sentence. I really enjoyed trying to figure this one out. It is a name at the top of a document entitled 
al señor mis and you can see here that it begins with an a and an l and then followed by an s with a raised or and then some scribbles so initially i was confused because i thought it was going to say alonso or something along those lines but with the help of other paleography students we figured out that it was al señor mis i saved my favorite page for last in this presentation because I find this so funny. You can see on this page the different forms of handwriting and yes we already did look at this page previously but what I found so interesting was the change in handwriting so you can tell that someone else wrote on the same page and you can tell that the handwriting is going to be a little shaky so it makes me question who was actually writing this. Was it somebody on a ship or was it an old guy who didn't have a steady hand was it a young scribe who was drinking? So there's a lot of things we have to put into consideration as to why the handwriting is the way it is. And we'll never know, but it's always going to be funny to guess and imagine what they were doing in 1675. My goal as a paleography student at USF St. Pete is to deepen the knowledge we have of Florida history. By reading through these documents, we can correct the things that have been written wrong about Florida and add to the things that have been written correctly. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and if you have any questions or comments please feel free to leave them. I hope you are having a wonderful year and I hope you have a wonderful summer.